Thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, like uh, my name is Ben Beharin. I'm a principal analyst at Creative Strategies, which is an industry analysis and market research firm. Um, my focus is on consumer technology, so we do a bunch of research on behavioral trends, just how consumers use technology. Um, we study over 30 countries of, uh, of, of in different markets, and like I said, with the, just trying to understand how consumers um, use technology. And we've got a, a great panel today. I'm really actually excited about this topic. I think it's something that um, isn't really being talked about enough. Um, it sounds kind of novel. I mean, it'll sound obvious the way some of these examples that you guys will see. But I sort of had this interesting experience that kind of led me down the path of thinking more deeply about this. And it, it happened at Disneyland, of all places. Um, and I don't know if you've been there, but if you use their app, um, it sort of starts with this very rich location-based and visual experience. So the whole map, you know, is, is designed to look like Disneyland. So the castle looks like the castle, and Space Mountain looks like Space Mountain. And you can see anything from ride times. You can see um, food places that are around you. You can make reservations. But the entire experience is 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 a map. Like it's all about where you are and what's around you and what to do. And I just thought that was a really fascinating way from a customer service standpoint. So it kind of brought out this thinking of you know what happens in kind of this next era of mobile, which, you know, if, if you're on top of industry lingo, and you know, we like to talk about how there was the first phase of mobile, and so now we're sort of moving into the, the second phase of mobile, mobile 2.0, as some people like to call it. And, and I'm really convinced that location and location-based services and, and proximity and hyper-proximity is going to play a really big role in this kind of next phase. And I think thinking about the UI now from a map and a visual you know, centric view, not just lists and text, even when you think about search, I think it's a really, really powerful and profound way to think about using apps and using services, especially when they're hyper-local. So that's kind of the things that we want to go into today. We've got a great panel of people who are all kind of taking that um, example, and you'll see some of those. Um, so I'm going to let each one of them kind of introduce themselves. We've got some visuals so you can kind of see what they're doing from an app standpoint, and then we'll launch into, uh, we'll launch into some questions. So first, we've got Open Listings. Cool. Uh, hi, I'm Judd, uh, CEO and co-founder of Open Listings. Uh, we're a service that helps you uh, find and buy a home. Uh, you manage the entire process on your own, and then um, with our help and our, and our software, and we'll give you back half the commission that would typically go to your uh, real estate agent. Cool. Hey, I'm Aaron London, head of iOS development at Lonely Planet. We're a company with 45 years of experience in the travel industry. And uh, we've taken that to the next level with our guides app, which is a city-focused guides app with over 200 cities worldwide. And our most recent app, uh, Trips by Lonely Planet, which allows users to share their own personal travel experiences with one another. Woof. Well, I'm Sebastian. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Woof. And Woof is a social-based uh, festival and nightlife platform that focuses on connecting music and people and locations. And uh, basically, we answer the question, um, who's going where, what's coming up, where do I need to go, when is the DJ playing, and uh, kind of the experience you were talking about Disney, we do that on festivals in cities. And based on, the, based on that location-based experience, we provide memories that are tied to that locations in uh, personal after movies. Hi, I'm Alex White, uh, VP of Product at Weed Maps. Um, as you probably guessed, we help you connect with cannabis. So connecting consumers and businesses in the cannabis industry to find products, find dispensaries, get deliveries, uh, learn about the brands as they evolve and as the cannabis industry becomes more mainstream. And yeah, we just recently launched online ordering. So um, if you are interested, if you put in 27, Pier 27, you might be able to get something through the front door. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, happy to be here. Awesome. Cool. My name is Katie Waxman, and I manage the cartography design team at Uber. Half of my team is sitting right here. Hello. Um, uh, and our team is responsible for the expression and the user experience of the map within our many services and products that you can see here. Cool. Thanks a lot. 
Um, so one of the things that, um, that I want to launch into kind of right off the bat is, you know, what you guys are learning about um, customer behavior when it comes to kind of this, this sort of paradigm of, of using location. You know, when you think, when we look back at um, just how software has evolved, right, and we've, many companies look and they, they do business analytics, they look for insights on their customers, and largely we've been doing that with a text-based world, right, or video. And now you have this opportunity to really capture location and sort of behavior in that. So we'll sort of just go down the line and just kind of ask, you know, what, what do customer insights mean? You know, how do you think about customer insights with this, especially around behavioral data? And again, how's that tying back to kind of like the core business agenda that you guys have, where again, it's com commercial or, or consumer? So we'll start, yeah. Yeah, Wolf is, uh, for example, all about uh, real experiences. So a map is a really perfect place to uh, connect our users to a location and get them there as fast as we can. And we've seen that, um, comparing that to other apps, that a, a, a really uh, small session time, so less time on your phone, is a perfect way to, uh, to use Maps for. So on a festival, uh, you want people to experience as much as they can. And using maps, you can quickly uh, get the user from point A to point B. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, one of the core things uh, for us that we've learned that location and maps can, uh, can help with. Cool. Alex, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think um, in cannabis, there's a number of um, business owners that are getting in, applying for licenses. So the market is growing quickly. Um, and for a consumer, you need context. Um, it's not as simple as finding a Target or a Walmart or any common brand that you see. These are starting out as mom and pop shops, growing into big consolidated brands. So you need help to find them until they can get to a size where you already know where they are. And so maps for us and location in general helps set context for um, finding the dispensary of your choice, finding products that you need for medicinal or recreational purposes um, it all starts with where you are and where the supplier is. And so without maps, it'd be very difficult to connect the two. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, our business has this very unique challenge, which is um, we focus mostly on the buying experience. But um, obviously, most of the customers who are uh, uh, using our platform are, are shopping before they're buying. So we use maps and other parts of the experience to show how magical the buying experience is going to be before you actually get there. So uh, maps and location-based service helps us um, you know, uh, be anticipatory, make sure that the, the experience is personalized as possible, just have the map be elegant and fun and a place that you want to engage. And then when you're going to the point where you're ready to actually and find a home, you've actually found a, found a home and you're actually ready to buy it, um, because you've had this um, bespoke experience throughout the funnel, which is mostly driven around maps and discovery, then you know that um, touring the home or putting an offer a home, which also involves maps, but uh, is going to be as magical as, as the shopping experience. So we kind of think about it in those two, those two phases. And maps is really core to the first phase. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've uh, been in the industry for 45 years. And our goal of inspiring and supporting uh, travelers to go out and explore Maps are central to that. I mean, we've gone from uh, building them by hand with glue and film back in the day of print publishing. And um, when we did the research for the Guides app, it was very, very clear that a map-first app is what users wanted to support both their inspiration and their on-the-ground on experience. And um, using the Mapbox SDK and the level of customization that we could do to bring all that experience that we have in, in print to mobile and then expand upon that but maintain our brand identity and our experience with mapping was super critical and important. Uh, yeah, at, at Uber, the map is everything. It's the center of most of our products. You're probably most familiar with the, the writer flow, the request flow. Um, but there's so much more than that, just the visual of you know, your location and where the car is coming from. There's all of the underlying data and location data that's powering all these experiences. So it powers things like, you know, ETA is how long is it going to take for my car to get here. Um, it powers like crazy mathematical pricing formulas that I will never understand. Um, it powers ETRs, which is for on the driver's side, estimated time to request. So they understand like, oh, okay, I'm going to get a request really soon. Um, it powers like, you know, is this restaurant blowing up right now at 12:30 in New York City? Um, you know, we need to get some couriers over here to pick up the food. Um, 
So it's absolutely essential to everything um, that we do, for sure. So, and I'm curious to, you know, all of you guys, which I think is really interesting, um, you know, you've sort of brought in a very specific visual look to the things that you are doing. You know, this is not, this is relatively unique. I mean, honestly, you look at a lot of different companies out there and how they deploy maps, and it's the same boring map that you see all the time. And I'm just curious, you know, obviously there's, there's brand and there's something about that, but, but did you learn anything about, you know, how having a much more deep or how the visualization made a difference in the customer experience or, or even just the pattern of behavior that, that worked in your favor. Um, so I'll just kind of let you guys go down the line, just talk more about like why you thought so deeply just about how things are visualized than just the standard boring map. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, in our industry, um, festivals and events invest heavily in their brand, in their own look and feel, and they try to build worlds for their visitors so they can uh, switch the world off uh, for, for a weekend or for a day. So it's really important that when those visitors and our users are at those fe festivals, they stay in those worlds. They stay over there and they can switch the world off. So the, the experience we build on maps has to be um, just like the experience that is around them. Um, so that's why we, well, we invest a lot of time and heavily in customization and building also those, those, uh, those worlds for, for our users. And that payoff is really, really big. Almost 60% uh, of uh, people that go to a specific festival download our, our app. And the, the, the number one thing uh, they like is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the customization and the cool, cool maps that we build that they can find their friends on. So. I feel like Woov, out of all of us, you have such a fun style. It's really, it's really like has so much personality and so much fun in it. I love that. Awesome. And, and I think you know the, the broad point is like that to me often seems like just kind of missed opportunities from a lot of companies that are using maps to just take that, you know, that that deeper visual. I mean, we again, you've <coughs> thought about UI very differently, even not just from the desktop web, but to mobile and now apps. And I think this is a new way to think about UI. And it's just again, it's not. It, it sort of feels like location is just oh, I'll add it as an afterthought versus deeply thinking about how that completely changes the experience. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, for us, um, maps similar to Uber, um, play a role on the consumer side as well as the business side. So from a consumer side, our job is to really leverage the utility of geography and context. So we're trying to make it easy to get in, find a place that you, you want to order from, and get out, um, because they're really looking for that job to, to place an order to find a supplier of product. So take away any friction we can. Um, and that's an ongoing challenge. Um, from a business perspective, we have, I didn't show them on the slide, but um, we have drivers that carry applications to get them to their customers. And those apps serve as a centerpiece for their job as well. And it comes down to navigation, route optimization, um, and getting the clutter out of the way so that they can be quick and get a, a fast ETA and stay performant so that they can beat their competition. So our tools allow them with the map at the centerpiece to, to win. <clears throat> you don't call it. ETH or something like estimated time. <laughs> ETHC. Like, <laughs> well, I would, I would, except CBD now. If anyone's following, CBD has no psychoactivity, so um, which anyone can try and is now becoming more mainstream. So, time to healing, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good. It works for us. Medicine. <laughs> um, we have kind of an inverse challenge, which is like real estate, our domain is um, incredibly information dense and overwhelming. So whenever we design anything, and especially maps and customization for maps, we're always thinking about how to like strip away. And um, you imagine your, your search experience for homes is like all these clusters, and it feels overwhelming. You're never going to get through it all. So we think about how to um, just remove uh, complexity, organize information cleanly, make maps not feel like there's a million other layers. You're accidentally clicking on something you don't mean to be clicking on. So the customization there is really just um, trying to make something really inherently complicated feel approachable. Hmm. Yeah, to, to build on that point for us, I mean, our goal is honest, independent, trusted travel content that we're overlaying on a custom map and being able to surface the most important things at higher levels and then allow the user to zoom in to see everything without overloading them is really critical to making an elegant, usable app. Um, we're, we're always finding the good fight to respectfully not look like Google. 
and to not follow Google's patterns because Google is the, um, the archetype for how a map should look. And there's a lot of these patterns that they've built out that everyone now is like so comfortable with. So we, we sometimes, I know my team and I sometimes go back and forth on like, oh, do we really have to do it this way? Can we push on this? Can we change this? Can we change this color? Sometimes we can't because those patterns are so ingrained. They're so international. Like people understand them in every country. Um, so you just have to use the pattern that's already there. Um, but sometimes we're able to push things here and there and say, all right, let's make this more fun. Let's make this more custom. Um, that's what I like doing. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's a really interesting point. I think there's two kind of key takeaways that, that you guys hit on that I think are interesting. One is just how, in so many cases, um, this was a better way for you guys to present inf information and get rid of friction. You know, I think when we think about how our mobile devices can, can work in the future, you know, everybody, every major platform, whether it's Google or even Microsoft and Apple are talking about just helping you get more done quickly, right? They just kind of want to keep us from staring at these things as long as possible. And as we think more about, like, what augmented reality might be, I mean, it's really all about just kind of adding a layer of, of compute that eliminates this need for us to just stare at these things, all, like let us get back in the world. And so I just think that's a really interesting way to, to, to think about how you can use mapping to, to move customer behavior in that way and just not people stuck with this dense bit of, of, of rich text. Um, and even, you know, the one question I want to bring too, which, which you hit on, was just the idea of, you know, where might there need to be standards, right? Because we haven't really talked about this whole idea of just standards. I mean, obviously, a building can look like a two, and you need to see a road. But you guys have all sort of taken this different approach about what a third-party service looks like on your platform or how you interact with a person on that platform. So I'm just curious if you think, you know, because I tend to think thinking about maps as a platform is a relatively newish kind of thing to think about, right? Both Google and, and Apple aren't really taking this approach of like make it a development platform and at which point you need some standards. So I'm just kind of lobbying that out there to you guys as a, as, a, as a broader question about, you know, what do you think about standardizing or st what standards might need to be when you think about this kind of map-centric, map-first UI? Um, I, I think it's different per... I, I, I don't think you can do a standard for, like, all of our products, for example, yeah. because it's so different <coughs> our use different. cases. Yeah. yeah, I'd say for our use case, um, some of our use cases, again, because we have tons of different surfaces, some of our use cases are so reliant on accuracy and, like, trust that we have to follow, especially certain patterns. Whereas someone like Move, you can get a little more like fun and joyful, yeah. and you know, because yeah. because it's less about that like perfect pinpoint accuracy. Right. Um, but some things we think about, um, we think a lot about internationalization. So can this icon be understood across all these different markets? Um, you know, in Japan, for example, they have completely different icons for schools and whatnot. Um, so we wouldn't be able to use the Japanese icon for school here in the U.S. I'm, I'm not sure if we could use the US icon for school in Japan. They probably prefer their original icon. Um, so we, we think about that a lot um, in an international context. And I think you have to divide usability standards also from just like implementation. People obviously need to know how to like click and zoom, and there are certain patterns, especially mobile, that you have to adhere to. But like you don't have to mean you have to have a map tab that you have to go in, and that's the like primary search experience. Like we think about how do you surface maps contextually or location information contextually. So if you book a tour, then the map comes up and it's suggesting you other properties and telling you where to go. Um, or other kind of interesting use cases like that. Even in uh, the core part of our experience is we learn where you're shopping and we give you a feed of homes as immediately as they come on the market. So we had to design a new pattern that's like, where it is is still really important, but it's, a, it's like an Instagram feed. So we had to design a pattern where you like, we used to do where you swipe left and then the map appears and that was really fun. And now we have a little icon to tell you that as well. Um, so just thinking through um, maybe making up your own patterns for things that aren't in the map, but how you uh, contextualize the map within the experience is like something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Hmm. Yeah, we have, um, coming from our print legacy, we have our own standards that we've mm -hmm. established. And um, being able to bring those to the mobile map was just a start. And now we're in the space of thinking about, OK, how, does, how do we explore further? How do we build new standards? Um, yeah, and you can get to maps a bunch of different ways through the Guides app. And um, you know, how do we encourage users to engage with that map has been a, a big question for yeah. us as we've developed it. Yeah, for us, um, maps make a lot of sense when you're going to a destination that has a physical place. Um, but for delivery, um, you don't care about where they're coming from. You just care about how long it's going to take to get there. Um, now, I guess in some cases, you care exactly where your driver is. And cannabis is still 
a little sensitive about where all the goods are. Um, <laughs> but uh, as a consumer, I really care about how, how long is it going to take to get to me. You're coming to my location. And so in that context, the, the map priority shifts to the driver of using the map to get there. Their destination is now the customer mm -hmm. address. So I think it's just about approaching the problem in our case from the right user perspective. Yeah. There's also some standards there that you might have to deal with around anonymization. Um, you know, if they're coming to you, yep. I know that at Uber we're talking a lot about sort of anonymizing those situations where, um, you know, the address isn't like firmly fixed. Um, so instead saying like, oh, go to this intersection instead of this like specific address. I don't know if you all have to deal with yeah, that. Yeah, there's some limitations like you, they typically will crack down on like drop off at a gas station or something right. kind of um, <laughs> indis you know, discreet. But um, uh, yeah, generally we do always want to think first about customer data and protect that, um, especially because there's still a stigma in cannabis. Sure. Not everyone is open to um, sharing their uh, position in the market. And so um, to each their own. And we want to um, create a product that can service everyone regardless of if you're comfortable with it or if you're still you know, a closet smoker, um, for example. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is something I wanted to touch on too, so maybe we could go a little bit deeper, and I think it, it's going to vary entirely from you guys, just the idea of privacy. You know, I mean, I think this, this, how you engage with trust, especially when you, know, you open a map for the first time and all of a sudden you see where you're at. You know, I remember I, I had this experience, which many of you may have, like with Snapchat, for example, I was like, holy cow, like my, my, see where my children are. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like a, hmm, I don't know if, you know, it's just, it's just a different sort of paradigm. So I'm mean, just curious how you guys kind of think about that, because it's one, it's a trusted part, right, to use your service. You know, in some of these cases, it might be like, I don't want any information about me, but I still do want to have some location information. So how do you think about building that trust if somebody does want to have anon anonymity or more deep privacy, but still use your service? I, th I think the, the, the answer lies in give, giving complete control to the user on who sees them and being very open about it. We have a 90% conversion rate on uh, opt-in of location. And I think you have to have very specific use cases on why you use location. And explaining the why to that user is, uh, I think, the, the most important mm -hmm. thing. For example, when our user goes to a festival, he knows that when he doesn't turn on location, he won't get a personal after movie, he won't see his friends, he uh, won't be able to get notified when he's close to certain, uh, certain things. So explaining that to the user and having them opt in based on those payoffs is, is, is very important, but also have a, giving them very easy access of removing those permissions again. This gives the uh, the user, the feeling that he can easily do this without having to remember to do it. And uh, I think that, that well, for our, our product, that really works. Hmm. Yeah, we're very similar. Um, we don't require account setup to use the service. We do IP fallback, so we can generalize where you are so that you can take advantage of places near you. Um, and if you do want to create an account, we try to incentivize that and similar to your use case, there's more value if you sign up, um, more sticky features, and uh, more reason to stick around. If you give us a small amount of information, we can create a better experience for you. But for the anonymized user, we don't want to block you from taking part in the community and, and finding what you're looking for. Um, for us, the privacy around location is not that hard. It's more inherent. You know, you need to. If you want to localize a map, you have to opt into it. Um, but we deal with a lot of privacy stuff around, like we ask people for their financial documents, which is like their bank statements to be able to buy a home. So we think a lot about privacy in general and specific to that use case, and we've done a bunch of iteration there. Um, so again, yeah, explaining, giving people permission. The other thing we've done is um, think about features where um, you can give people even more control. So like allowing them to black out certain sensitive information is something that we were working on. Um, auto expiring docs at a certain time and telling people why. Maybe you could auto opt people out of the location. Hey, you're not at this festival anymore. We went ahead and unshared your location. So kind of a magic moment six months later when your docs are expired anyways and we go ahead and take them out of the system for you um, is a cool, kind of a cool feature we built. So um, stuff like that has been helpful in, uh, for financial disclosure much more than location mm -hmm. disclosure. Yeah, to echo those points, uh, for us, the value proposition to the user is pretty clear. 
um, during onboarding we prime, but then the first time any user interacts with the map and they are already granted location permissions, we say, hey, uh, we'd like to access your location so that we can show your location on the map and show you all the awesome things nearby. And we also have like a 95% opt-in for location. All the features of the app are usable without an account. Um, and so we have this great history of trust with our brand, and so we've been really conscious about carrying that over into the mobile app and preserving that. Uh, Uber has an interesting history with this question. <laughs> um, though 27, 2018, it's been top of mind, top priority to really harden and mature some of these privacy um, policies. Um, but I want to talk about one situation that was like sort of a fail on our part. Um, I don't know if you all remember, we at one point uh, auto opted you in to track you, well, the option on iOS is to track you either only in the app or always. Um, and we, <clears throat> excuse me, auto opted you into always. Um, and it, it popped up this really scary notification and the notification was all this legalese explaining what we were doing with your location. Um, <clears throat> and it really backfired. And I can say that 100% the reason for doing that was pure and actually really cool. And it actually garnered some like really beautiful insights. But it was messaged and it really didn't respect the agency of the user because we just auto dropped you into this experience. Um, so in doing that, I think we learned a lot about um, choice, giving them clear, like here's why, but you don't have to, options. Um, and it actually made me learn a ton about the whole field of design uh, of content and copywriting. Um, we actually had this whole team take a pass after that on our privacy settings, um, and they were literally just looking at the words. So how can we make these words you know, more truthful, more transparent, more honest, um, and how can they work better for the user? And we switched all the wording to, to make it much more friendly, much more understandable, um, and of course we switched from auto yeah. opting you in to always. Um, and it was just, it was a really, really, really interesting presentation from the content and copywriting team right. to see how much words can actually help with that privacy question. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of these are, I mean, you guys aren't the only ones. I think there's lots of examples where people just didn't really understand the implications of real-time location across the board. And you're, these, are, these are new learnings. I mean, that's the thing is like you look at people who take this approach, which is very visually and location-centric, and it's, it's just not something we've we've been immersed in for so long. So we're learning new things, right? And I think that's what really makes it interesting is there's core new learnings, yet there's so much upside in the experience of these things. It's worth going through those pain points, but I think hitting on these points of just privacy and, you know, and, and, and the really key point, which a lot of you guys echoed, is just make it really, really easy for the customer to just maintain and manage their privacy. I think that's a giant lesson Facebook learned and is now pivoting <laughs> to. Um, but I think that's absolutely critical. Um, so another question I had was just kind of how you guys think about third-party integration. Because again, I think we, we're talking about trust, you're talking about privacy. And it's kind of one of those things where you just don't want anybody going crazy on your platform, right? You might have either an individual or a business. And so how do you guys think about um, how you might integrate a third party or what third parties might be able to do on your platform? Because again, I don't think you want to just dictate to them everything. You want flexibility because you want a, a good open marketplace. But also, how do you, do, how do you maintain some level of, of quality control and um, so that no bad actors go crazy and, and do something bad on your platform? Well, we actually don't have a lot of third-party uh, uh, integrations on our platform. We obviously work with Mapbox, but our uh, uh, relation is really close. So I think that's in, that's in uh, first uh, important. The second point is that we have these organizers that integrate on our platform, and we have really cr clear um, uh, agreements on what they can see. And these are only based based on insights. Sorry, I'm losing my okay. my voice, <laughs> as you can hear. Um, and getting those 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 agreements right is is um, is, is of course uh, extremely important. We don't have a lot of third party integrations right now on the platform. Okay, um, I think for Weed Maps, there's a lot of information that is flowing through the system, so it's important for us to have really strong roles, permissions, and policies in place to control that access. Um, strong agreements in place with the third parties we get involved with, um, and really strong relationships to back it up. I don't think we're ever going to be interested in getting involved with any other third party unless we really know who we're working with. 
um, because there's a lot of information and privacy at stake. And so I think those set of guidelines and a really strong bond between business to business on who you're working with, um, you know, it can thrive. So that's what we try to get in place in front of so it. So in your guys, do you do a lot of like vetting up front? Like these we do. Are, okay. Yeah, we integrate with labs, um, point of sale systems. Um, those nodes have a ton more access to other information. So there's a lot that's connected. And so it's really important that we have um, the right throttles on that um, and that everything that is exposed is intentional and purposeful and with value. Yeah, so we operate our business as, a, as like a two-sided marketplace. So when you go on a tour, when you put in an offer, you're still getting paired with a local, a local agent. And so there's a ton of information about our users, both as they've shopped and also their like financial information, information about the home, all their communication that we need to disclose to somebody who's helping you. So I mean, it's a, it's a really big challenge. About half of our time is spent on like internal tools and back-end admin software. So I would just think, um, think of them as a, as a user equal with your end user. Um, use the product as them all the time to see what kind of privacy and other information you're accidentally disclosing. Like we fixed something recently where we had user notes on there in a certain context that we were actually passing along. And there were internal notes about a user that we didn't necessarily want the, in that context the partners to see. Um, so we have to just like make sure to remind ourselves and everybody internally, even though nobody is actually doing this role at the company internally, just pretend that they are. Make sure you have automated testing for everything. Um, really just like think about it as a two-sided marketplace and think about the product from their perspective and kind of design it from them. Maybe similar to like an Uber driver thinking about the product from their perspective at all times. Yeah, from the mobile space, uh, Lonely Planet is exclusively focused on um, customers. Um, the company as a whole is very, very picky about our partnerships. Um, maintaining our trust and identity is very, very important to us. Um, in terms of um, the, I like the bad actors on the platform question because um, you know, we're just dipping our toe into more of a social media user-generated content space with our Trips app. And um, our goal there is to you know, filter out the not so good stuff and we keep a, we watch it like a hawk, and, uh, but we also curate the really good stuff and push that to the top. So that's what people are yeah. experiencing. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much I can speak to this because we have a whole team of really brilliant <laughs> business, uh, you know, opportunities, um, people who connect us with third parties. Um, I know we do certain um, Snapchat integrations. We partner with, of course, Mapbox, uh, Google. Um, but one thing that is a little interesting about Uber is that we, we do a lot of stuff that could be done through a third party, <clears throat> excuse me, and we actually decide to just build it ourselves instead. Um, so, for example, our customer service um, tool, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, um, but it's a custom built to, I can't hear you, but thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, we built a custom tool to handle, uh, you know, tickets coming in from people, in part because our trip life cycle and trip data is so complicated. I don't think any of the, you know, I'm not sure what the names are even of, like, you know, third-party customer service tools. But anyway, uh, I don't think they could handle the complicated nature of like what these tickets need to involve. You need to see like where the original pickup location was, where the actual pickup location was, where the driver deviated off the route that was fired from the routing service. Um, and it just, we were like, let's just build it ourselves instead. Um, so that's a little bit of an interesting thing that Uber does sometimes. They're like, we'll just make our own. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I do want to dive a little bit, um, I know some of you guys are deeply into, into this than others, but I do want to sort of dive into the, the marketplace question just because, again, I don't, we haven't really thought about using maps as a central sort of philosophy for a marketplace. So I'm just kind of curious because, again, there's, there's ways that if I'm on your platform as a marketplace, I might want to try to entice customers to make a decision with my business or my service, right, or my listing, for example. So I'm, just, I'm curious how you guys kind of balance that. Um, so that, again, it's not necessarily neutral territory. Again, you could say, well, we think about it similarly, um, like Google might have thought you know, about PageRank, just how we align something with your interests. But I was kind of curious just to dive in on that, because I do think this is open territory, how we use mapping and location as a marketplace, and just kind of what that might look like um, from a comp competitive standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I think for, for Weed Maps, is a big, there's a big place for this in the B2B space. Um, there are farms, there are cultivators who grow cannabis, they have specific locations, they're producing in bulk, and they need to move that product down the supply chain to the end customer. Their customer is actually the retailer, generally, so 
They're looking for retail shops. Those retailers are also looking at the farms to try to find access to product. Um, and so I think the map plays a role in where is it. Um, currently, you can't transport cannabis over state lines just because of the federal, uh, the current federal law. Um, and so there's limitations and geographic boundaries that you have to keep in mind. Um, it's different in other countries like Canada and, and Uruguay and a few other places that are a little more progressive. But the map is required to understand where you're going to get this large amount of product. And we see the rise of distribution um, in cannabis as well. To They have separate licensing. They have secu uh, background checks, et cetera, to make sure that they're enabled in the right type of person that's transporting a large value of product from one location to the other. And so um, from a marketplace standpoint, the, the map on the business side does have a huge role. Um, and then from the retailer to the consumer, you get another marketplace. And the map also plays a role in finding access from a retailer. So yeah, we see it end to end for, for this industry. Um, so our implementation, we solve that problem just by heavily managing it and not really giving either a service provider or a customer so much choice in terms of who they want to pair with. So our core value is really around making it simple. So one of the pain points we see is people don't want to choose an agent. They're actively trying not to work with an agent. So if you need somebody, it's location and their availability and their rating and all these other things are factoring into how we pair people. But we kind of actively try not to give too many people choice or disclosure or information from like buyer to service provider um, and to try to handle all that logistics all on our own and kind of make it silent and invisible to the user. So you just want to buy a home or you just want to view a home. You don't want to you know, see five star ratings from 100 agents that look the same and choose based on a headshot. So most of that's just managed silently and you just get this magical experience where somebody shows up. Well, that's kind of the approach we've taken since the beginning. Yeah, for us, I mean, it's a given that uh, a travel app is inherently location and, and map based. A lot of the research that we did before launching the guides app um, proved that uh, users were really focused on a city guide experience, so limiting the scope of the map to the city. And um, surprisingly, still offline maps are very, very important. Um, you know, we're focused on a global audience, and that's a real differentiator for us because a lot of people are still, when they travel abroad, are not having um, real-time uh, network access. Right. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think for us, some key points are safety and accuracy that we're really dialing in on to make sure that that moment of pickup is as accurate as possible. And part of that is, of course, location data, map data, but it's also designing your system and your UI to be able to handle those moments when like a human event, you know, intervenes. So, you know, in reality, yes, we might, you know, perfectly navigate you to your pickup points, um, you know, reverse geocode location. Great. But what is it like actually to be driving and to pull up and your navigation system is telling you you've arrived, but maybe there's 20 people on the side of the street. You're not really sure who the person is that you actually have to pick up. Um, maybe the pickup zone is a little, you know, not great, so you decide to spin around the block. Then what happens? How does the system sort of recover from those situations? Um, so I think that's part of what we try to inject into our product is that empathy and that, you know, like uh, the, the reality of how these digital locations end up you know, manifesting in the real world. Um, you know, we encourage all of our designers and engineers to actually drive, to pick up riders so they can feel what that feeling is like of course, to ride and report any issues they see while riding. We encourage people to bike, to be bike couriers. Um, so we're sort of marrying that uh, you know, accurate, real-time, brilliant engineering algorithms with that like, empathy about what the actual experience is on the ground for people. Cool. So we have time for sort of one last question. Um, and I'd sort of be, be curious. One, one of the things I was hoping to do with this panel is just trying to get everybody thinking about this new sort of design philosophy, right, of information in the map. So I'm just curious, you know, if you guys have seen any other really great examples that you look at and say, this is great, we use this as inspiration or things that get you thinking from a design and a visual standpoint, if there's any other classic examples that you've looked at or really like that, that other people can check out for ideas. I, I, I think um, Zenly is a great example for that. It's uh, also a location sharing app. And locations on a map are, are just locations on a map. And what they do is providing context 
to certain locations. So seeing what your friends are actually doing, answering the question whether you should go there or not. Um, I think that's, that's, that's um, also for us a really cool thing to, to grow towards of not only showing what there is to do, but what's actually happening at there at that moment. Um, so I think that's... Uh, that's, that's uh, what was the name of it again? Zenly. Yeah. Um, to be honest, uh, Mapbox. Um, <laughs> for all the Mapbox employees here, nice job. Um, you guys have created a... I, I look at Mapbox as a, a source of inspiration, a lot of the data visu visualizations and designs, different topography. Um, I think we can leverage that as a toolbox to create new experiences. Um, there are a lot of location apps out there that help you find some source, some destination. Um, I think what Woov is doing is really creative. Yeah. Yeah. It's this one. Yeah, this is like insanely creative. Um, also, I think. Um, for better or for worse, snaps, maps, they've started to explore a little bit more and pushing the boundary, um, whether it's invasive or not is another question. Um, but yeah, I would say Mapbox for the tools they provide and that, that's really, they've opened our eyes into what is possible, especially on the back end, like visualizing routes, visualizing um, pedestrian, um, you know, walking patterns, things like that. <coughs> I'm going to go with a quick old school recommendation. Uh, Edward Tufte, like data visualization, all sorts of historical map inspiration everywhere. So definitely checking that out all the time and seeing weird ways in which maps are distorted or information is represented pictorially in interesting ways. So that's always like a core piece of inspiration for us. Yeah, one for me is uh, one we actually uh, support bouncing out of the app when you want to get directions to is City Mapper. I would do it's a really super focused app that focuses on getting around in a city on public transportation. Um, that being said, uh, there's a lot of features um, that Mapbox has released recently that will eat into that and we hope to adopt pretty soon. <laughs> um, to go a little uh, outside of the app space, I get a lot of inspiration from video games actually, some of their wafering <coughs> concepts and their you know, heads up display concepts. Um, and then this game is so old now, but I don't know if any of you have played Mirror's Edge. To me, that's like one of the most gorgeous cityscapes that has been designed um, since. Um, so I get a lot of inspiration from that. Um, just on the like pure visual design inspiration, I have a heavily curated Pinterest where you can find not like recipes and junk. Uh, all right, I pin recipes also, but. Um, you can find some like really beautiful boards from people on there, um, especially um, you know other gaming concepts. You can find tons of stuff on there, um, tons of upcoming car in-car HUD designs that I absolutely love. I, I don't know if you all caught Brennan's talk yesterday. Brennan showed some like really awesome designs in that space. Um, Behance, Dribble, of course, um, and then on the app side, I have a real soft spot for the the Transit app. It's literally called. Transit. Yeah. Um, and they've done some really nice stuff with um, how to sort of showcase a complex trip where you're switching lines and paying money and getting on and right. off cars and whatnot. Right. So. Yeah. Cool. And like I said, if you get a chance, check out the Disneyland app. I thought that, that got me really thinking just about similar experiences, a lot of the way that, that Woov is thinking about these local experiences, just to get your brain thinking about just presenting this information around localization and hyper-localization. Um, so with that, join me in giving our panelists a round of applause. We appreciate all your guys' time.